What's up, everybody? We're here for another episode of the Masters of Sport podcast, and I'm here with my co-host, Earl Kunkel, also co-author of Parabolic Periodization and the Sports Performance Bible. Oh, wow, yeah. You're letting that one out of the bag. It's coming. <laughs> yeah, I guess, well, maybe I'll be here by then. I don't know when this comes out. We'll see. Um, so, Earl, yeah. recently we had a little text exchange. Yeah. And I wanted to prove to you how much smarter I am than you are. I don't know if it makes you smarter, but you definitely had a piece of knowledge I was totally unaware of. So that means I'm smarter. No, no, no. Have you ever heard It's Borges about his library? No. All right. So if I want to say I'm smarter now. So he has this. It's, it's like fake. This, you just made this up. Is no, this no. Anime? It, it's real. No. <laughs> anime is real, too. But it's this idea of there's a library, and they're in hexagon shapes. And this library has every single book ever written ever could be written, ever will be written in the future and in the past. But it has every possible book that could be written. So it's like a way cooler version of the Library of Congress. No. It's out there. Crazy. So you could get a book and it could only be the letter A the whole time. And you can pick up the same book and it could be all the letter A's, but one of those A's is capitalized. And you would have to go through all these books and think about just how many different books you'd have to go through yeah. before you found one that had just maybe some sense in it. Okay. Go home. And then there'd be eight other books, ten other books, just like that. Yeah. And then it's almost like an where, idea. Where is this at? Like, is this it's a... just something he created. Oh, okay. Like fictional. Yeah. You know, real imaginative. So, anyway, you're smarter than me. Go ahead. <laughs> So we were talking about, I think we were talking about, were we talking about Pennsylvania Dutch or Thanksgiving? No, we were talking about people who do podcasts. We were like... Yeah, but somehow it came up where Jason said like, oh, he was, no, I think it wasn't around Thanksgiving though. It was around He said something like, oh, classic like American imperialism. Well, that was to it, but it was first, you misread a name, like... Whose name? He said he. I think he wrote like Conrad something. Oh, and you. No, wrote, I purpose. I purposely okay. did that. Yeah, no, I purposely did that. And you wrote back Conrad Weiser. Yeah, he commented the podcaster. Yeah, uh, yeah, I forget his. I forget his last name. But I was like clowning. And I made the comment because I've only ever heard of Conrad Weiser. As you were like, like oh, a school it's a, district. Oh, Pennsylvania oh, so school district. Pennsylvania school. Yeah. And then you were like, well, holder actually, of the heavens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So now to inform you on. Yeah. Conrad Weiser, basically what it was. And I think I think Jason's comment about classic imperialism was after the Conrad yeah. Weiser school district comment. And then right. I said, like, no, no, he's actually not, as by all accounts, I don't, I'm not a, a, a certified Pennsylvania Dutch historian. I do think, my understanding was, he's a German dude named Johann Conrad Weiser. And he was Anabaptist in Germany, and there was a French group that was basically raiding Germany. A lot of these Anabaptists left, came to New York, and came to Pennsylvania. He went to New York and then fled uh, from Albany down to Berks County, where we actually are located, um, and learned how to speak like five or six different native languages. And he was like a direct... Indigenous languages. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So like uh, uh, Lenny Lenape was like the main one, I think. And, and he learned how to... He was like one of the few white people around the area that was actually helping uh, like be a diplomat between like, okay, this is their area, this is our area. Like we're allowed to go hear their saying, but we can't go here and they get this. So I think that... I think, I, I, it could be completely wrong, that he was like sort of opposite of William Penn, so basically. if there's a such thing as a good colonialist, which is a big if, it seems like, <laughs> it seems the, yeah. like he was trying to... <laughs> to do it as, as diplomatic as possible. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good way If to there's it. such a thing. Yeah. Maybe we could have Sam on here to disagree <laughs> with us, and I could cheer him on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would be a hard conversation, because it's like... That, it would just there's so many facets to that era, yes. you know it's tough. But yeah, anyway, that's where the discussion was based. And I think what's interesting is like learning that about, especially where we are, is like, it's it's like it, when you drive through Massachusetts and Connecticut and you see, you see like areas that have like buildings that were built in the 1600s, or if you go out to like Albuquerque, you can see like actual um, writings in stone from like 
two thousand years ago, and right. it's like holy crap! Like it's just the 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 actual you know if you think of history from the mindset of like the relics of it, yeah, and like the recorded history, it's neat to sort of put yourself in that mindset of what was it like? Yeah, it's you know? it's almost like um, I had this one guy. It was, he, he used to call me a social, an SJW, and I was like, what was that? I didn't even know what it was. Yeah. And he was like, oh, it's this. I was like, oh. He's like, they're so bad. I was like, yeah, if they're so bad, we'd probably still have slavery because someone wasn't complaining to be an abolitionist. Yeah. And, yeah. and he's like, did you just say that? I was like, yes. I was like, you need people to complain about what's wrong with the world All the for time. the world to be better. Yeah, it's, it's it, like it, when, when people get upset about, dude, that's my biggest complaint. In society, is like, oh, if you want to, if you want to complain, go move to another country. Yeah, no. It's like, have you? You clearly have never run a business because if <laughs> your business is gonna get is gonna get better, you need someone to bitch at you to tell you, hey, yeah. Dane, when you assigned me this blog, it was disorganized, <laughs> and then I have to be like, damn, I gotta fix my process. Yeah. Oh wait, should I tell you to go work somewhere else? Like, no, I need yeah. to get better. It's my it's my issue. It's like these people who say dumbass stuff like that. Yeah. It's like. And you're so stupid. You're the reason why this place has problems because you're too dumb to adapt and get better. And I think that's like a, a personality trait too. Like you need to be able to accept the criticism and like if you can't or if like people are scared to give it to you, like you're going to just remain in that tiny little lobster shell and never yeah. get bigger or better type of thing. Uh, anything. Yeah. And your bench will suck and you'll never be able to... I can't bench regardless. Your I'll... snatch will never be 129. I never hit this. 126. Seven. I 127. Hit... <laughs> in training, 26 in competition. Okay. Now, my new goals, though, are totally different. I'll never be able to... Well, I could run five miles, but I probably never will. No. That's not the goal. I mean, for me, like, you are, can I tell a real funny story Only because you real said quick? that earlier. Real funny story. Go ahead. Before was, we get into our main discussion piece. I was at work, like my other job, and I was like talking to them, and they were like, hey, do you want to, I was talking about, I just, out of the blue, I said, I'm going to run a marathon. They're like, not a half. I was like, why would I do that? Yeah. That's <laughs> like, like no. a fake. It's fake. I was like, why? What's the point? Yeah. Like. I'm just going to say I'm going to do this and I'll do it. I, I, I do think running a marathon is one of those things that's like, I, to be fair, I think you have to run a marathon in under five hours for it to be like, okay. Well, here's the thing. Unless you've got I'm like not trying to compete. Or, you just want to finish it. But I could... They, they thought they were being smart with me. They asked me how fast I run a 10K. Or maybe a five 10K, and a half hours. Maybe five and a half hours. How fast I could run a 10K. And when I answered them, they didn't follow up with anything. Yeah, it's like, Because uh, I, I think I, I don't, my 10K is not fast. It is not fast. But it's respectable. I, I ran a 10K just because I was, ma like, I had been running no more than a 5K. I think I ran maybe four times within two months and yeah. one day I decided to run the 10k and I ran it in 53.13. Okay. I don't know, I, I know that's not good like, because when we talk about good we think elite, yeah, like yeah, world class, yeah. like that's nothing. Well, I'm just trying to think, Caitlin but, ran five miles, she ran a five mile, the, it's called the George Sheehan and she ran that in 33.30. Oh wow. Dude, she's fast. She's really fast. Wait, no that might be wrong, might have been 36.30. That's still really fast. Because it, dude, that's she one, was, she that's was one more mile. That was so she was, she was like the seventh highest finishing female in the race. Yeah, like that's she was fast. Burning. And she was walking. When she finished, she was like walking deliriously. Did you see that kid from Oregon? When the he, cross country he tank? Himself? Oh my goodness! He he was like crawling. It, yeah. it was like he just his body dude, like shut down. He went. He was going so crazy. hard. They're crazy, dude. Yeah, they're absolutely. I mean, I did that this weekend where I just pushed myself aerobically and I feel so terrible. Well, that's like when... I think I think 10K is a little different than super high interval. Like, yeah. if, if you get your heart rate up to, like, like, 165, 170 and come back down and go back up, I think you feel worse than if you ran at, like, 120 uh, to 130 for... I would say maybe... In I, maybe I think for they a marathon mess would be you up bad. the same way. Marathon would be bad, but if you go out and do that for two to three miles at a steady pace, that's a lot easier than yes, a crazy, crazy. Especially interval. mentally, it doesn't feel as awful. Yeah. yeah. In any way. Yeah. I don't know. On my way down, I was thinking about the the people who've been doing like uh, squatting five hundred and running a mile in the yeah, same day, impressive. which is impressive. But 
I was trying to think. I was like, the the energy systems aren't as far off no. of one another as like to say like, all right, go ahead, squat the five hundred and run a marathon in the same day. That'd like, be nuts. And I would be overly impressed if you could squat the five hundred after the marathon. There's no way. Yeah, I know. No <laughs> that would be absolutely you have no insane. Energy. You, you would have nothing in your body yeah, to do. It would be. I wonder though if you could do it, fall asleep. Like recover and do it within a twenty-four hour period. That'd be interesting. If you ate a lot after the marathon, yeah. If you after the marathon, you're like, all right, I'm gonna crush a ton of food. Maybe you could then. I've never had trouble eating a ton of food. <laughs> then you fall asleep for like six hours. Yeah, maybe you could do it. Who knows? All right. Speak. This is like totally against running, right? Almost reflexive strength. No, I think running, I think you need this to a point to benefit, like it's a good benefit for running. All right. So, can I tell this, uh, another story about my first time doing a reflexive strength movement in front of people? Should we, dem should we discuss what it is or just tell it? I think we'll get into it. Okay. Like, people will get this idea. So, I was training with your programming. Yeah. And you had me doing, with a barbell on my back, a single leg, like, good RDL, morning. good morning. Yeah. In step through into a lunge, yeah. and then you know, back up and again and doing that. And this one uh, female trainer at this place started like talking about me doing this, like how dumb it looked, how idiotic it was. But she was talking to my wife, and my wife is someone who won't like. Well, she's like. She's smart, she's clever, so she let the woman keep going. It wasn't like, oh, that's my husband doing oh, that. Oh, she didn't. She didn't, like, oh so my gosh, just no let, way. lets her keep going. Oh my gosh. And then tells me about it, and I was just like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, who's this thick and they know what they're doing? Like, I know who I'm working with telling me what to do. Yeah. And I tell you about it, and you probably forget. And you got so mad. <laughs> you were just like, these, you know, just you, like your little rant, like you're kind of throwing things. And it's more, for, some, to me, I think it's more for show than like legit upset. Like, it's just like, all right, I want to communicate my point. Yeah. Here's how I'm going to do it. And that was the first time I ever heard of Franz Boschen too, okay. through that discussion. Yeah. And I was like, all right, who's this? So like, I started reading, we started a book club about yeah. reading Franz Bosch and things. Anyway. That was my story. Just Pete, someone saw me do a reflexive strength movement and said, "Look how dumb that is." Right. And was just like oblivious. Why do people look at these movements and go, "Look how dumb that is?" I think they they look at it because it it's like the load is lower. Right. So one, the weight is lighter. Two, it's a movement they've never seen before. Uh, and three, they might be thinking like, "Okay, you know, it's just not traditional." It's it's like. Is this a functional movement? I think that's where it, it could get lumped in theoretically into a functional pattern. Not functional patterns, like functional patterns, the, the group but of, of crazies. But like actually it could get lumped into functional people. You know, And someone like Joel Seaman, I've seen him do reflexive work in, in, in some of the stuff. So that, that could be like people's knee-jerk reaction is always, if you're doing that, then your whole thing is this. Yeah, yeah. And they don't see, like, how each little tool can actually feed a, a larger system. Right. They miss me snatch. They miss me clean. Yeah, 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 yeah. They forgot that I just back squatted heavy. And now, yeah. like, it's the end of the session. Oh, he's doing right. this. Yeah, and you're going to figure that out. And, 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 yeah. and you're going to utilize that to, and, and for a weightlifter, you're going to utilize that to help with imbalances, um, do coordinative movements that you don't typically do. So it could help with adaptation. Uh, could, like, increase the intelligence of your nervous system. Uh, it's going to help with force absorption in, in certain positions with your posterior chain with what you were doing. So it's like, dude, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's like a, a movement series, and you would explain this pretty well <clears throat> on like the X, Y, and Z axis where it's literally, right, right, right. it's like three, it's like, it is three-dimensional. I think, I mean, everything we're doing is, but it's like more so projection forward or on angles forward yeah. and i think that that's what makes it unique and also can make it uh, it's it, if you're a creative strength coach it can be really a powerful a powerful implement to use speaking to the xyz i think of like your drop dumbbell snatch yep to a box right 
like think about how many moving components are to that. Yep. So first I have to go down the Y axis to grab the dumbbell yep. while my leg is going back. Uh -huh. And then I have to step through and while I step through all of a sudden my arm has to come in and come up and I have to be able to coordinate my landing with my lockout while holding my balance. Yeah. And then, as you said too, like I could complicate that even more, and I can instead of my target being in front of me, all of a sudden I can go diagonally. Right. And right there's my Z axis. All or of go a into, or yeah, or go into a hip lock where you, yeah. where you try and you know for a distance runner you would you could do like, uh, like what you just described with a drop snatch or a side drop, and then you snatch and you have to get into a contralateral hip lock position to try and coordinate, you know, your gut you know the dynamic trunk control with that that reaction component and it's like it's sort of weird that we're talking about this <clears throat> because this morning I, you know i've i've tried to play around with now starting to do like a little more warming up but like quicker warm-ups like five to ten minutes of just constant like weird movements like foot uh -huh. movements pvc pipe walk toe walk heel walk uh and and we were doing Jan and I were doing like a twist of the plate up to that. Okay. And it's like when you start to play around with it, I think for warm ups or later after like an absolute strength movement, I think they're really, really phenomenal ways to actually train your body. Like if you would do it as a warm up, um you're warming up on different planes, like we just talked about. If you're doing it post max strength, you're actually I believe training your body because it's so aware from recruiting such high threshold motor units with heavy load that now when you go and you use a reflexive pattern and, and you can figure out with an athlete where their reflexive uh, disability might be. Okay. Now, because they're heightened, you can improve that reflexiveness um, with this, these styles of movements that we have come up with or that Bosch has come up with. Or I mean, we've come up with a lot of different yeah, things. Yeah, you have. And so it's, you, you have some too that target you use for specific sports more yeah, yeah. too and you see them more within programming right um and because as someone who's never thrown a discus like i've seen the discus athletes do different ones i'm like right. where'd that one come from right and that dude that's a that's a good example so it's like <laughs> stuff like that now it's like okay if we hit like a big time back squat and your body is like super aware and we've discussed this in the past with dr b where dr b would almost say that your nervous system, if you're stimulated too much by absolute strength, it could override the technical work that you did earlier, which I don't necessarily believe. But what I do believe is that if your nervous system is so aware from absolute strength work, when you put in the reflexive work, I think it, it can train it at a higher degree. Yeah, especially if, like, I know with your programming, like, it's usually technical coordination type of movements first. Yeah. You're... Um, your absolute strength and then like your plyos and your accessories and like yeah. you can use reflexive In as accessory movements yep. so it feeds into that line of like sort yeah. of programming yeah. as well with that and it's like i always think too when you see reflexive movements as weird as they look they also always look way more athletic yeah like especially when they're done well i think that well there's a dude we have a video uh, we have a video of sam when he was doing i want to say it was like it's like a 70 or 80 kilo like <laughs> yeah, single yeah, leg yeah. RDL power snatch stepping forward. And it's just like, boom, like straight through. And there's just no, there's no like, uh, uh, uh. Yeah. You know, it's just like, wham, right through. And, and I think that you can get someone to be smoother and and be be able to accelerate properly where it's like one thing instead yeah. of being like fast 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 like some people are like sort of like tense like this and so they, yeah, when yeah. they get off balance on a single on a single leg they don't know how to accelerate because they don't have the reflex uh those like skills built into their system yet have you noticed when you have i want to say an athlete who's played multiple sports comes to you and starts weightlifting yeah that they handle the reflexive movements better than someone who is just weightlifting yes okay absolutely yeah i now i, I do think dude, what's crazy is ryan mcdonald doesn't he he did play football when he was younger uh-huh but dude he can do stuff like that and okay it's, it's so clear what type of that like he's legit coordinated and i got I think, you i think that 
I think that when you when you get somebody who's good with that stuff and they can react quickly, you know, I mean, Jan's a good example. Jan's like someone who, um, two-time state champ, yeah, right? two-time PIAA <laughs> state champ, NFL <laughs> linebacker, uh, Penn State linebacker. Like when he when he does it, it's like very smooth, very reactive. It's like I think the best way to t- to term it would be like elastic. Like okay, you want your athletes to be elastic. You want them to be able to absorb and react and use it properly and use it snappy. Little that Reed Richards in there. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I I think like I think that's my downfall with with power lifters and 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 also like dude, a lot of the people who now are getting into reflexive work are like. To a point, almost like anti max strength. Like they won't come out and say it because they know they'll get roasted, but they'll yeah. be, they don't want to lift heavy. And if they lift heavy, it's like, oh, we'll do trap bar deadlifts. And it's like, dude, put a freaking bar on your back, do a heavy back squat, and then try this. And you're gonna see in six months what your athletes are actually gonna turn into. They're gonna turn into total freaking savages. Like someone like, dude, here's a good one that I, that we use a lot with Nicholas. Last all last spring in the summer. We have our power elastic band, the the real heavy band. Okay. okay. I have him reach out like this. Okay, so he's reaching to the band here, and he's posted up single leg, left leg goes back. Okay, so left leg comes back, and he's left arms here, and he's got come through, and well, he would go, he would come through, and the right knee comes up, and he does like a row and holds. Okay. His, his knee and the hip with walk. the hamstring helping him coordinate yeah. to pull the row yeah, through. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so when he's doing this, the first couple of weeks, like the f- first week, he started to twist. So he would like row, he'd like pull, and he'd like twist this way. And you could see him favoring his one leg because he had a hip injury two years ago. After like three weeks, dude, all that stuff went away. His hamstring start, started to like fire equally, basically. And then all of a sudden, he stopped falling off one side to the other because of the way he was controlling his trunk. And I think that's those are movements that after you do like a single leg squat or a front squat or anything, now he has that reflexive capability through a greater range of motion as well. And and those are those are weird banded reflexive movements that we've used to increase cutting ability, to increase uh, even starting strength and starting speed. And it even sounds too like the lower intensity almost serves like a with you're saying his hip yeah almost like a physical therapy type of yeah for sure well too like yeah and you're not even necessarily aiming for that i guess you are kind of you're doing the unilateral work yeah, to get the balances yeah. out but like it i guess then too the lower intensity allows for more recovery as well yeah. too right like, yeah. so there's there's just tons of benefits that right. keep popping up well all right so me i'm one of those guys i don't like absolute strength let's say so i'm like how can i get away with just giving reflexive strength or Am I going down a bad path and it's like, yo, hold up a little bit, check your brakes. How old are the athletes? Uh, well, all right. Let's, st- that let's start up. at the youngest. You okay, know, so youngest 12, 10. 10. No, you can't do it. Yeah, right. I, I think there's like a very good relationship with your elite athletes where it'll be like, you know, or any athletes. If you have youth lifters or athletes here, football baseball, basketball, wrestling, whatever. They need absolute strength training. They don't necessarily need reflexive, but they definitely need absolute. If they, they'll benefit from reflexive to a point. But you can get enough out of just doing the techno, technical coordination and absolute strength. Now, on this end is the world-class athlete who's 27 years old. Okay, So 27-year-old uh, field hockey player. They don't necessarily need to do anywhere i would bet you know, in a week they could do four or five sets of absolute strength work and they would be perfectly fine doing mainly technical coordination because they already work. developed that yeah they've already got yeah the they career. already have a ton of that I, I think maybe up till like 25 you could push it and then after that it's like all right now you can do you can get away with more of that work um i would still push a little bit of absolute strength but not nearly to the high degree well I think the problem is a lot of strength coaches read these these things from someone like Bosch, and this stuff's great, but then they apply it to a 15 year old, and then the 15 year olds meet my 15 year olds on a football field, and they just get curb stomped. Yeah, and it's like, and dude, you can't you can't train the young well, kids. Bosch like that. is dealing with like top of the line, right? Yeah. Like yeah. he's dealing with your 27, 26. As far as I know, yeah. Like he's not. 
the best rugby players in the world, yeah. the best soccer player, yeah. Which is fine. Like, yeah. you, you pay the cost to be the boss, right? You get yeah. to work with high-class athletes all the time. Like, right. do it. Like, yeah. live it up. Um, I guess when we talk, though, will reflexive strength, like, work? Will it make me stronger, though? Or won't, like, in a general sense? I was just going to say, it's like defining strength. It's like defining... I think that's another struggle with, with like, strength and conditioning is that we operate... We operate in a strength world where it's like back squat and bench press and deadlift define your strength or, or a power clean defines your strength. I think um, strength on the on on like on a wrestling mat, you know, I, I, I'm thinking right now, it's like if you took someone like Jordan Burroughs or Kyle Dake, like, okay, take them out. They're the, they're the one, they're the best of the best. Yeah. But take someone who's like the level below Jordan Burroughs or Kyle Dake. And maybe you you feed them uh, more reflexive work, and now all of a sudden, their footwork and their their ability to react on the mat, or if if we're even talking about the next level down of a football or a rugby player, or whatever the sport is, I do think that reflexive strength can cover a little bit of ground to catch those one percenters. Okay. Does it make you stronger? And is, the hard thing is that it's it's. At this point, not as clearly measurable because of the load is so light. Now, I do think that there are the only benefit I'll give currently in my studies, in my own experiments, is like there's a couple different uh, velocity uh, based tr like training things, like units that you could use that you could get better feedback from okay. to, to show you if you're actually making those strength gains. Through the speed. Through the speed, yeah. Got to be fast. Yeah. Fast, and then if you maybe increase the load by five. Is there such thing as a slow reflexive strength movement, or does that completely defeat the purpose? I think an isometric action somewhere. Okay. Yeah. I think if you if you caught it, the thing is it's still not going to be considered slow. Cause right. You know, if you, like, drop something, it's like... Yeah. And you hold one, two, whoa, and you do something crazy, you know, then... It could be a slow and controlled into something else. I think that would be, I, I, that's how I would use it, like a pause or a... I got to be honest, my favorite thing about reflexive strength work is like, it's essentially like discovering a whole new color to paint with. Yeah. But. Dude, so what you just said, this is, how, this is what I think is going to happen. And I, and I, I think it's going to take 20 years and I, hopefully we are still doing this podcast and we can cut back to this clip in 20 years. <laughs> I believe that based off of what we're seeing with geriatrics and, and geriatric training, so like for years you weren't supposed to do resistance-based uh, strength tra resistance -based training as, a, as an adult. Once you're like 50 years old, you stop doing it. My goodness. You know? So, cause that, then they, <laughs> that like scares me if there's ever a time when I'm like, you can't put a barbell on your back, man. I'm <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, yeah well, tell me what to do, kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then they started to figure out like, okay, osteoporosis and, and uh, bone density can be improved by doing this. Okay, so then that, okay, that, that, was, that, that was ironed out in like the 2000s. Then it was like, oh, you shouldn't be doing jumping. You shouldn't be doing um, movements that are a little bit more uh, shock related. Now that's starting to be proven out that like, oh, that actually helps some like box jumps can help, you know, a 60 year old because if they, they learn how to recruit quicker. So if they slip on ice now, they can handle yeah. it. Or if they you know, slip on a banana peel in a cartoon, they can actually <laughs> absorb it. But I think what you're going to see is that exercise is... Because if you use skipping and then you start factoring in uh, reflexive movements, these are complicated movements. And I think people are going to start using them and seeing massive benefits with the geriatric community because they're lighter load and it's going to force crazy amounts of, uh, of coordination. And we're even seeing that, that difficult physical challenges for the geriatric community can improve or prevent dementia, Alzheimer's. I was gonna say, like it that. feels like, a, it's almost like a crossword puzzle Dude, it's for exactly, the body. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. exactly, so, so that's what you're gonna see. It's gonna take, it might take 15 years from now, 20 years from now, but that's what's gonna happen. And, and physical therapists are already gonna start to use this now, because they're gonna see like, wow, this isn't that challenging. Let's put a two and a half pound plate 
in an old lady's hand or an old dude's hand and do an overhead yeah. into a forward lunge. It's like, a, I don't know how to say it. It's like you go, you go to the in-law's house and you're like... And they're like sitting there with the Sudoku puzzle. Yeah. Next thing you know, it's they like, stand right, up. I, got, I got my app for my reflexive work. Here we yeah. go. <laughs> That's got to be a key part of our app, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lift. Yeah. All right. Some uh, fan questions, you yeah, think? Yeah, I'm excited, yeah. All right. The first oh, question. Oh, yeah, you hammer toe. All caps. <laughs> all caps. Dude, just, I just think it's so funny, hammer toe. <laughs> <laughs> All I've seen is like hammer toe is, uh, I'm picturing a foot now with the big toe, like just <laughs> yeah, hammer. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and like they're about to go step on a nail, like up from, a, and the hammer's just like, nope. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm sorry. No, I like that one. Um, just bought the two programs for uh, BJJ. Wonder if there are any alternatives to Olympic lifts or if I should just get my life together and learn how to clean. Can I answer this one? Yeah. Learn how to clean. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's it. I think it's like, um, Actually, I want to make sure I didn't turn my mic off there by accident. Um, yeah, we're good. I think one of the things that, ironically, seeing Phil DeRue this past weekend, he had talked about how like he sort of was self-taught with cleans and snatches, and he was like, dude, I had no idea what I was doing. I sort of taught myself, but no one ever really sat me down and like, like this is how you got to do it. Right. And so he's like, so I've always had just a negative association with it. And I think that now, especially in 2021, you know, if you think about when he was coming up, it was like the late 2000s, early 2000s, or 2010s, early 2010s, late 2000s. There wasn't, there was not anywhere near as much information on the internet to actually learn properly. Like, dude, our clean progression videos are really, really good videos. And like, they're, they're, and I'm, I'm not just saying this because they're mine. They're actually really good stuff that, that people can learn how to clean. And so I would say, like, dude, just learn how to clean. Yeah. And if you struggle with it, you know, email us, and we can help you. And if you're still struggling with it, email us again. And then if you still struggle, then we can find an alternative. That's what I would say. Yeah. You can do it. Yeah, you can if do you're it. Doing, hammer if you're doing BJJ, you can clean. Yeah, you're coordinated enough yeah. to do it. Yeah, you, and you're going to be mobile enough to clean. Absolutely. You, you can do it. Yes. All right. Nathan Sutter. I like uh, this one. Do you know anything? Spe except that spelling. I don't know if he put uh, That was probably just a typo. On okay. Part. Do you know anything about how TRT affects sleep? Does TRT reduce the amount of sleep you need from a producti productivity standpoint? And then he just said dynamic trunk control. Yeah, I like that part. Yeah. DTC. Um, I think it depends on your age. And... and, and I mean, I guess TRT in theory would be if you're therapeutic use. So therapeutic use is ideally you're going to be over the age of 30 um, and you're taking testosterone replacement because you are you have hypogonadism, so something's wrong with your production of testosterone. Um, and so other hormones can be drastically out of balance because of this. I'm not a doctor, but I would say in my mind... Um, your sleep should be improved probably initially. Uh, does TRT reduce the amount of sleep you need from a productivity standpoint? No. Like long term, you're still going to need normal amounts of sleep. And one, you're on therapeutic use. But even if you were on high dose tests, you're still going to need uh, the same amount of sleep. And look at sleep as like this anabolic agent. It's not like something that you can skip out on. Um, I do think though that when you start taking tests for if you're on TRT specifically, that it will enhance or improve your overall sleep because now your cortisol should be, you should be a little bit less stressed throughout the day, which in turn will lead to better, better sleep. Works for me. Yeah. There you go. As long as you're focusing on your dynamic trunk control, your whole life will be <laughs> fine. <laughs> it's like, it's funny. Like people are always like, "Oh, look at their biceps! Like they look strong." It's like that's with your shirt on. When your shirt's off, it's like, "What do your abs look like?" Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or your back? Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's funny, yeah. Anyway, I, besides my, just silly things. Rusty one. Okay. Just a capital R on, on this one. Um, how do you attract clients when first starting in gym? Oh, that's a tough. Starting one, as a coach or trainer, I know you have an answer to this because I've asked you this. We've talked about this already. Uh, is this the one like with wrestlers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was I, the one about. I was gonna say, I think so. I, I've there's there's a couple. There's like 
But see, those wrestlers already had. Well, that, but like it was, you gave a good response with that. Like, okay, so what this you is what used, we, like to sell yourself essentially. Like, this is what I would say first is like, I, I would, for me personally, I was fortunate enough, I was like somewhat well known as an athlete in high school in this area. Okay, so where I, where I live. And I was a state champion uh, shot putter. And in Pennsylvania, if, if you're a state champ, they'll throw a parade in your town. Like that needs to be said, yeah, especially like, the smaller ones. Yeah, yeah. especially the smaller they, ones. They worship their their hometown here. Like, yeah, and and so that that can make for a very a very beneficial situation if you're starting a business like that. That will get you clients. That will attract clients. And if you can get in the door with four or five of them, now all of a sudden you can blow them up and get them stronger. And that's that's the word of mouth. That's what that success is going to get you uh, more and more clients, right? So I think that that's one thing. One one thing. I don't know if this is exactly what Earl's talking about, but even with wrestlers in the past, what I've done has been like, dude, we're going we're gonna to do crazy bodybuilding stuff so they just have these massive arms. And what happens is it helps with intimidation in a sport like wrestling or football, um, even basketball. It helps like from a mental, they have more confidence. But then like parents will see these kids who are just yoked and like, <laughs> dude, I want to send my kids to this guy. I, and I think like when you're first starting off, if you don't have those things, you have to be somewhat strong or somewhat, like, if you're going to be smart, you got to put out content. If you're going to be somewhat strong, you've got to be in a gym and display that strength and someone will come up and ask you questions because you clearly are in an yeah. advantageous position and you know something that somebody else might not know. I, I remember talking about your wrestlers with their big arms. Yeah. Um, I, I worked with someone who was a wrestling coach in a, a very strong district yeah. in, in the state. Yeah. And he would love your videos, and he loved how you would talk about the different grips. Oh yeah, with yeah, all yeah. the pull and stuff. Yeah. Like he, he was just like, "Why don't more people talk?" I'm like, "Well, not everyone's this guy." Like, <laughs> uh, it's just, I just thought that was funny talking about wrestlers, big arms, and it's like, "Oh well, you don't always have to use a dumbbell like this." No, anyway, yeah, you don't. Was that what was that was that what you were talking about with my answer? No, no, mine was another one because I, I I could feel I could feel rusty ones like point like you know your stuff you're confident about it you want to go and help someone but like why do they want to believe in you right. like and almost how do you sell yourself to it because like I had a similar opportunity and like I had been working with you like and I I knew I knew what I knew you right, know what right. I mean yeah. and I was confident in and how to and I swear like when I talked to this one person I felt like this big yeah oh like, yeah, yeah 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 like and it was just like I don't I don't yeah. know what to do like I don't know how to convince the situation you. in your gym yeah yeah and yeah. I was like I, I was kind of like hey. what did I say to that you were like you, you can't basically what you said here like there's nothing you can really do about that like you yeah. can't change someone's perception or like yeah. what they think of themselves or how they view other people that's the one thing that people need to be aware of is like people will come in here and they'll they'll talk to Jake about like well, who are the, like they, they they see someone like Jake? Well, he's only 155 pounds. He can't be that strong. Yeah. It's like, dude, this guy can snatch more than you could. You would yeah. die under he a back bar squats back. Like, a triple body weight. Yeah, like, like dude, you would die trying to back squat his snatch. Yeah. And it's like, he struggles with that. But I also do think it's a maturity thing too, because he's still 24. It's like when he's 29, he'll have an air about him like, yeah, like it doesn't matter, dude. I'll talk to you about this and I'll throw it down. And if you still don't buy. What I'm trying to sell you, then go somewhere else. You know, right, it might right. get to that point. So I think it's like, be patient and and, and it, it's be patient and realize it might take you a year to find a, 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 you know, one person. But if you're as good as you think you are, that one person yeah, yeah. Will, will pay out. Just so keep it's, going yeah, for it. Yeah, it just takes time. All right, that's going to sum up today's talk on reflexive strength, Conrad Weiser, and how are you going to get better sleep on TRT? Until next time, guys. Peace.